In this video, I want to briefly show you another function on lists that nicely combines lists and pairs that we have just introduced. And this function is called zip. And once again, this is a function that exists in the prelude, so we hide it before we re-implement it. And what is the idea of zip? The idea of zip is that it takes two lists as inputs, and they can be lists of different types. And it produces one list as an output, but this list is containing pairs of A's and B's. And um, the idea is that a zip does not traverse one list only, but it traverses both lists at the same time in lockstep and combines corresponding elements with each other. The only interesting question there is, of course, that what happens if the lists do not have the same length, which we cannot require. The type system does not give us any uh, way to specify the length of the list. So if we say we uh, accept two lists, they can be of a different length. If they have equal length, then it's relatively easy. We produce a list of the same length where all the elements are paired up. right? But if they have not equal length, then we have a choice to make. But again, we don't really have so much of a choice to make because I've already said multiple times that crashing is not a really good option. So if you have a reasonable option that is not crashing, then we should take it. And what we're going to do is we simply are going to discard the elements of the longer list that are left over. And um, so if we zip, let's say, one list of um, 20 elements with another list of 10 elements, then the resulting list will just have 10 elements corresponding to the pairing up of the first 10 elements of both lists. And the extraneous extra 10 uh, elements of the first list will be, will be dropped in this case. OK, so let's try to implement this function. It just follows uh, principles that we have seen, but it is a little bit interesting because we really need to pattern match on both lists this time because we want to traverse both lists. So <clears throat> let's start by giving names to the arguments and then let's still, to be systematic, pattern match on the first list first which gives us these cases, right? But in, well, I guess in the first case at this point, we can actually say, given that we've already said that if the first list is empty, then um, we're going to discard all possible elements in the second list. Then we can already return the empty list here. Right? But in the second case, um, and then we can um, replace this with an underscore. But in the second case, we really still have to look at ys, because we are interested in pairing up the first element of the first list with the, second, uh, with the first element of the second list. So we have to split um, this list into two cases as well, so that we get this. And now, in this case, again, we have one list that is shorter than the other. So we return the empty list. And then I guess I could replace these with underscores. And here we are in the interesting case. And here we are actually going to recurse. And um, what we're going to do is not very difficult. We're going to pair up x and y, so form a pair out of them. And then we're going to call zip again on access and y. And that's it. So this type checks, and this works. So if we zip the list 1, 2, 3, 4 with this like list of characters or string a, b, c, d, right? we get 1 paired up with a, 2 paired up with b, 3 paired up with c, and 4 paired up with d, as expected. And if we make the string longer, 
and the list of integers and the e and the f at the end, they're just being dropped. <clears throat> and if we make the list of numbers longer, then still the shorter list wins. So in this case, the string is shorter. We pair up the numbers up to f, but the seven and the eight at the end of the list of numbers is dropped. This behavior that the shorter list wins is particularly interesting because one common use case of zip is to attach um, unique labels to a list of um, certain entities that we have um, obtained from somewhere. So say we have um, a list of users or something that we have uh, computed from something and we want to number every element of that list with a unique number. Then um, a way that we can do this using the zip function is to zip with a list of numbers starting from zero or one and going on infinitely. We've been observing this range notation without a final value before. So this generates a potentially infinite list. And then if we have a list of entities, so let's again just use a string here, then we still just get these six elements from the string and we get them numbered from one up to as many elements as there are in the other list and the remaining elements from the infinite list are just dropped. Right. So this combination of zipping of an, a potentially infinite list with a finite list is um, one very common use case of the zip function. There is also a variant of the zip function that is called zip width, which is um, sometimes useful. Zip width is a higher order function. And it um, takes a specific operator to combine uh, the elements. So zip width, let's hide that as well from the prelude. is defined in almost the same way. Uh, now, now we don't get a list of pairs, we get a list of Cs. Because again, the idea is we like traverse both lists right, in lockstep, but rather than pairing up the result, we just apply this function, this given operator to um, a corresponding elements. Or op I'm saying operator, but it doesn't have to be an operator, of course. So um let's call it f and otherwise the structure of this function is going to be um, more or less the same so i can even just copy the cases as i have them up here and um, and here we now call not the pair constructor on x and y but f on x and y and then zip with f on x s and y s and so a little bit of cleanup and alignment to do and f is not being used in anything but the last case so we can replace this with an underscore as well and now we can do um, so for example, if we have one, two, three, and four, five, six, we can zip with these two both lists with the plus operator. And then we get one plus four is five, two plus five is seven, three plus six is nine. Or if we zip them with the times operator, we get one times four is four, two times five is 10, and three times six is 18. Or we can zip them with the pair operator, and then we get exactly the same result as if we had been using zip. So another way to use to define zip if we already have zip with is to simply say zip is zip with applied to the pair constructor, partially applied to the pair constructor, because if we apply it to the pair constructor, then what's left is just a function from two lists to a list and um, the type of C is specified by using the pair constructors is specialized to have to be a pair of A and B. Right? If we look at what is the type of zip width 
partially applied to the pair constructor is exactly the type of zip. We can also further simplify the definition of zip, or if we had looked at it more closely, the original definition of zip as well, um, by observing that we have one interesting case here, which is the, the final case, and all the other cases uh, are mapping to the empty list. And this is a, like a situation in which I would say it is worth um, replacing these two cases with a catch-all case where we put an underscore everywhere and um, putting an empty list here. But now the patterns are overlapping, right? So um, the second case really matches anything, uh, whereas before they have not been overlapping. If the patterns are not overlapping, then only a single case applies and the order of cases effectively does not matter, right? And it really does not because the compiler rearranges cases that are non-overlapping in such a way that the dispatch is as efficient as possible. But here it really does matter, right? Because if we would flip the cases now, right? if we would try to catch all case first, then the second case would be unreachable. And with, as long as we have enabled warnings in GHC, GHC fortunately warns us. Um, it warns us, that it says here that the pattern match is redundant, right? That's perhaps not uh, the warning we would expect, but like from GHC's perspective, it says we don't really need another case here because the first case already catches everything. The second case cannot actually be reached, so it's redundant, right? But really, what often what a redundant match means is that we've uh, made a mistake in the order of patterns, or that we have made a previous case too general that it um, captures too much. Okay. So zip and zip width are, are useful functions from time to time, and they're certainly interesting to know about. And they're a, a use case, at least zip is a use case of, of pairs. Okay.